I think it is at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with the intro. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining today's TinyML talk. Um, today's talk is Get Ahead of the Curve, Develop Software in the Cloud for the Ethos U55 and Cortex M55 Processors. And today we're joined by Stefano Cadario, who is the Director of Product Management of the IoT Group at ARM. We'd like to thank today's TinyML's talk strategic partners. These are A on, an a on Devices, ARM, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Photohub, Greenwaves Technologies, Gravity Inc., HOTG, ImageMob, Itemis, Clica Tech, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Analog Devices, Micro AI, NXP, Prophecy, Qualcomm, Keeksco, Reality AI, Renaissance, Reeksin, SAP, Seed, SenseML, ST, Stream Analyze, SynSense, and Sentient. We'd also like to remind you that we have a tiny ML summit, summit coming up in real life um, in San Francisco on March 28th to 30th, and another research symposium on March 28th as well in person. So please sign up at those links listed here. We also have a tiny ML trailblazer series coming up with success stories from Marion Burhelst, a professor at the EEE department of KU Leuven, um, which is live online on March 2nd at 8 a.m. And you can scan the QR code below to register. Also, please join the tiny ML communities on meetup.com and LinkedIn. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, the Tiny ML YouTube channel. This is also where today's talk will be hosted um, after we are done today. And we have over 6K subscribers, 347 videos, and over 177,000 views. So there's a lot of resources there for you to view after today's talk. And also, I'll be doing a talk with the Tiny ML Talk series next week on advanced anomaly detection made easy. I'm Jenny Plunkett. I'm an Edge Impulse engineer. Um, and you'll see me um, next week at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So to introduce Stefano, Stefano Cadario is the Director of Product Management in the ARM IoT Group, focusing on driving new growth initiatives, as well as engaging in strategic relationships with key cloud partners. He obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in computer engineering at Politecnico di Milano, and more recently an MBA, MBA at Warwick Business School. Stefano joined ARM in 2012 as a software engineer in Cambridge, and he has taken on several roles, including technical specialist, product manager, and senior strategy manager in San Jose. Welcome, Stefano, and we're looking forward to your talk today. Amazing. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jenny. And I'm very pleased and excited to uh, be here and presenting today um, my talk about uh, Ethos U55 and Cortex M55 and how you can get you know, ahead of the curve, a curve by you know, developing software ahead of the time. Here we go. So today um, I have a, a few topics. I'm going to start talking about um, what's the what are the challenges uh, around software development for the intelligent edge uh, for you know TinyML, for example. I'm going to talk about our virtual hardware, which is a new product that we launched uh, last October at Dev Summit. I'm going to talk about Ethos U55, what kind of application um, um, an MPU uh, such as Ethos U55 can enable, and then we're going to show a practical example on how our virtual hardware can be used used uh, for uh, specifically the ML use case. And we, ha we have some time uh, at the end for, uh, for some Q&A. And you know, as Jenny suggested, please use the um, uh, question uh, Q&A uh, section uh, in the Zoom uh, to, uh, to ask any question. So um, let's start talking about the complexity of IoT and uh, IoT and ML. So um, if, we, if we look at the traditional embedded uh, software, we can almost see like a linear growth of complexity. If we start from the 8-bit, 16-bit, those devices were uh, uh, built and, and developed uh, using UGIS assembly, then you know, with 32-bit uh, microcontrollers such as the Cortex-M0 plus or M4, um, there's, uh, you could actually fit more uh, complexity into, uh, or, you know, a bit more complex software uh, into, into those devices because they were more capable with more memory, more, uh, more performance effectively, right? Um, but when we talk about IoT and ML, um, there are some uh, challenges, extra challenges that um, don't really 
um, uh, increase linearly, right? So, so if we're talking about interconnectivity, for example, and, and intelligence, you know, it comes with a, a very steep increase, a step in the complexity of the software. So for example, when you, when you introduce com uh, connectivity, uh, you need to take into consideration uh, different factors, uh, security, over the air updates, uh, networking stack. And you know, in rich operating system, if you think about Linux or Windows, most of those are that's packed into uh, uh, the OS, right? So you just use the API and it just works, but it's not very um, uh, true for uh, the embedded use case where sometimes you have to kind of deal actually with the low level um, stuff in terms of connectivity and security. Um, so um, for embedded also, uh, because there's such a variety uh, of libraries and a variety of device, um, sometimes it's very hard to keep uh, align all the different libraries coming from different sources and different versions and making sure they all work together. So uh, this problem is even more uh, problematic when there are security flows that are found and you know one of for example one of the components of your software stack needs to be updated right so you will need to make sure that everything again works together by updating just one device and it's not always uh, a given and um, if we add machine learning to the equation uh, the requirements for updates and keeping the device updated go far go uh, beyond the just the security right in some cases you might want to uh, cost them to refresh your ml model because it has improved or has a better performance performance or there's you know simply new data that you collected uh, at the at the edge and you want to deploy a new uh, better uh, more accurate uh, model uh, even multiple times a day so um as a, you know the chart on the right side of the screen shows uh, we could consider iot and ml uh, not as a kind of simple incremental change but rather a kind of a step change it measures disruption on how you uh, manage uh, embedded software So before deep diving in kind of how the latest and greatest practices to develop uh, software is worth actually taking a look how traditional embedded is, is done today. Um, and if you think about the you know, vast majority of disconnected devices out there, um, you know, let's say you kind of traditional washing machine or coffee maker, uh, you know, has been flashed and tested and validated uh, with the firmware during the manufacturing, right? During the product line at the end, it's flashed, it tested, it works, okay, let's ship it. Um, so the device doesn't have any internet connection or ability to be updated and from a software perspective the job is done um, is what i you know like to call deploy and forget um, the software team normally moves on and goes to a new project and you know the functionality as well as the security of that device are frozen in time there's there's no change um, so any software updates would be a massive effort it would be a recall the product recall which is you know very expensive um, another aspect is the software team the you know the, the release engineers are effectively in control of the full uh, the full flow right um, there's no firmware being released um, and flashing to the device that doesn't go through the kind of main development team so testing is relatively limited during development and the majority of the effort is reserved at validating the entire functionality of the device. And also because of the relatively small attack surface uh, to, you know, to, to get physical access to the device in an unconnected device, security is at best an afterthought. And you know, not, not often, often is not even considered uh, during, during the development. So when we look at enabling devices with intelligence, we should consider a very different type of development flow. Um, one that considers the close integration with the cloud, uh, cloud services, uh, both from a, a point of view of data collection, as well as training and deployment of machine learning models at the edge. So if you start from the left and we see data stored in the cloud, uh, useful training of the neural network. So the, net the network model needs to go through uh, a process optimization, such as you know, proning, quantization to reduce its size, to fit to the edge device. The network model then needs to be integrated with the rest of the uh, logic of the software, with the firmware and the, the, the stack that we talked about. Um, and uh, the, devi the device, uh, the, the software then that gets built and deployed uh, via OTA to, to the final device. The device in the fields needs to be monitored because um, you need to uh, monitor the state of the device if there's, there's been compromised or there's a new data, for example, that might be collected and that data uh, is fed into the training data back again um, to, uh, to retrain a new model that uh, perhaps has a better uh, accuracy. So as we can see from, from this chart, the development practices that worked for you know, traditional development, the, the deploy and forget, are no longer suitable to fit this more uh, complex flow. 
So uh, what we um, like to talk about is uh, a modern development flow. We talk about uh, a new paradigm. We call about uh, we, we can call it cloud native development, even if it's a bit of a stretch of the term in terms of embedded. Um, but we need practices or cloud native practices uh, for, for IoT. So traditional development focuses on the application first and then uh, build the infrastructure later. So cloud native development is the notion that we consider all factors from day one, from the ML training to the software development, from the over, um, over the air updates, uh, as well as data connection and uh, device management, uh, data collection and device management. So cloud native technology enables developers to build, manage and run software in a modern dynamic environment, all offered by the cloud. But when we when we look at characteristics, what we're actually uh, looking for, uh, first of all, we're looking at robust automation and testing uh, to make sure that engineers can make uh, uh, changes uh, frequently and you know predictably without you know very minimal toil. You'll be able to do uh, changes on a daily basis. And DevOps and MLOps uh, processes to automate uh, the software development process but also enable data scientists that might not be the same people that are doing the firmware to independently tune and update ML models without needing you know, the software team to, to do the work to do integration. Uh, last but not least, um, as devices are effectively connected and constantly connected to the internet, are exposed to security threats. So security needs to be addressed uh, from the cloud to the edge, uh, all the way through the edge from day one. So when we talk about cloud native development, it seems to solve all the problems. So where's the catch? The problem is hardware. <laughs> Unlike cloud applications, we, we can't uh, simply run IoT applications across virtual machines or containers, um, but we're bound to real hardware. Uh, first of all, hardware is difficult to scale. Although IoT boards and, and chips are you know, relatively cheap, they don't cost much, um, building and managing board farms is very expensive and requires certain expertise that often you find only in big teams. So if you ever had to rely on limited resources for testing and build, you know that compute and testing resources are always a bottleneck. So to add more tests uh, or to reduce the time to execute the entirely, you know, let's say the nightly test uh, test suite or the weekly test suite, you're always bound to the number of devices that you have in your board farm. Um, it, more recently, procurement had become a challenge as well. Um, um, you know, with chip shortage, um, it sometimes is actually impossible uh, to find your, your chip or you might need to wait several uh, weeks and months uh, to be able to, to get that on your desk. Another issue is the uh, limited uh, ability to reproduce and test software under special condition, corner case, such as you know, testing sen sensors at boundaries or simulating intermittent internet connection. That, those are really hard to reproduce in a, in a real environment. And finally, um, I would say very importantly, IoT boards are not available in public clouds. So you can't expect, let's say, an SD or an XP board available on Azure, AWS, or Google Cloud. So running firmware natively in the cloud is simply not feasible. So ARM virtual hardware introduced a, a simple and scalable way to remove dependency from hardware and unlock cloud native development. So you can imagine um, virtual hardware as the equivalent of virtual machine, but specifically for IoT. It's a bit of a stretch of a term, I understand, but um, just to make, uh, to make sure that uh, we are on the same page. Um, ARM virtual hardware provides a functionally accurate representation of an ARM-based uh, chip, SOC, um, and it simulates this behavior, which is visible from a software perspective, but it also abstracts the complexity around the underlying hardware. So unlike um, EDA simulators and emulators, a virtual hardware is developed independently from the RTL and is generally available ahead of the AP release. So that means that you can have, you can start developing software even before the uh, CD components has access to the IP or the CPU or the NPU that is gonna be available. So ARM has loads of experience in that. Uh, we've been developing uh, virtual hardware for, uh, 15 plus years um, to, uh, to make sure that we can develop software uh, pre-silicon development before the chip is even available. Um, and it's used also as a way to validate and verify that the, uh, the IP is behaving as it is expecting from the spec. So um, what, we, what we've done with our virtual is really giving uh, the broader 
um, uh, develop a software developer ecosystem, the ability to start developing software um, in the same way that ARM and his, you know, and the Silicon partners can, can develop software ahead of, ahead of uh, uh, Silicon availability. And ARM virtual hardware targets are effectively simple, you know, Linux binaries that can run uh, both on your local machine, but uh, more importantly, can run and scale in the cloud. So what are the main advantages? Um, so first of all, and it's you know, mentioned multiple times, cloud development. So virtual targets can be encapsulated and managed through the cloud infrastructure. That means that it can scale um, in any, you know, it, it very rapidly to you know, 10, 100, or 1,000 different instances of the same device. Think, uh, think about uh, the way you can do testing on this, right? So if you have, for example, uh, 1,000 tests that require um, one minute each, if you are limited to 10 boards in your board farm, it's going to take a while to do all your testings. But think about a, a, um, a situation where you can, uh, in, in a minute, uh, as launch a thousand different instances of the same device and run all your tests in parallel. Obviously, you can optimize your, your testing infrastructure and you can get feedback around what's working, what's not working uh, very rapidly. Um, Another uh, use case which is which is really interesting, specifically for uh, for ML, is the ability to test and validate the performance of a model um, across uh, in parallel, effectively um, across multiple configuration of the hardware or multiple configuration of the model. So I think about you know different um, uh, science models, so do, you know different layers and different architecture of the models uh, being launched uh, and tested on uh, on the same device all in parallel. So if we look back uh, again at the software development flow that uh, we saw earlier, um, we can uh, immediately notice how ARM virtual hardware can fit into, in, into that flow. So on the left side, for example, virtual hardware can be leveraged to estimate the performance of an optimized machine learning model, all directly in the cloud. You don't need to uh, flash your actual device, uh, your physical device. You can do all, do all that in the cloud. Um, this enables effectively data scientists to more rapidly experiment and test different uh, network configuration and optimize, uh, optimization tactics. And we're going to look at one of use cases um, uh, for, for my demo. For a software development perspective, you know, beyond the kind of uh, uh, obvious advantage of being able to develop software without having a board on your desk, um, you can think about the uh, scalability of your CI infrastructure. You can simply run or move at the vast majority of your uh, CI test in the cloud and in your launch virtual boards uh, whenever is needed um, in the cloud um, and with all the tests running in parallel. So you don't need, you don't have more, you know, bottlenecks due to broken boards or faulty power supplies or your flash um, is, is broken or uh, any, any other reason. So, um, Specifically for this audience, I think it's important to talk about um, obviously ML and the capability of what you can do today uh, with a, a you know a very kind of simple uh, Cortex M4 device that I have in my hand, a uh, uh, Arduino uh, Nano 33 BLE Sense. Um, I don't really need to <laughs> uh, tell this audience, uh, you know, what kind of use case uh, or uh, with you know with just a, such a simple device you can you can achieve. But you can imagine that you know uh, use cases, you know, personal detection and gesture detections can be done in such a small um, and relatively low power and, and low cost device. Um, that means that those capabilities and those use cases can be enabled in much wider uh, range uh, of device. Um, and now. Something that you you would never you never hear or I personally never heard somebody saying is that we don't want any more computational power because what we have is enough, right? Especially with the same power budget, and that's the reason why um, ARM has uh, released um, Ethos U55. So Ethos U55 is an MPU, so it goes along the um, the uh, CPU. In this case, it could be an M55 or it could be a, an M33, uh, depending on your configuration, but it it allows, um, it gives effectively um, more than two orders of magnitude, more performance um, into the same um, power envelope, the same type of devices that uh, you were you know, using in your, you know, for example, the, the Arduino board I showed earlier. And you can only imagine what you can do um, or what, what kind of user application you can do when you have um, the ability to run um, 
hundred times uh, more faster ML models, right? So the uh, the type of use case um, is, is is much bigger, is much wider. Um, we uh, this is uh, a product um, or IP that has been launched, um, I think about just over one year ago, um, and this is already silicon. Uh, available from uh, from Alif, for example, Alif announced uh, back uh, in uh, September, October, uh, that they their uh, their silicon um, ensemble silicon, I think it's called, um, has an M55 and U55 that you can use already, and is very already uh, available for, for for testing. But uh, there are other silicon partners um, in the in the next few months, uh, in 2022, 2023, that will release. Um, devices with uh, this NPU integrated. So I'm um, looking forward to see what uh, you are, um, uh, what you're gonna uh, create with that. With, with that. So um, in this case, um, I'm gonna talk about um, one specific uh, ARM virtual hardware that uh, we have available. This is the um, uh, Coastland 300, is a, a reference implementation or reference design from ARM and is mostly used by Silicon partners to uh, effectively validate and test um, their capability of the M55 U55. And in some cases, Silicon partners decide to take that as a block and integrate in their, in their SOC. Um, this is the ARM virtual hardware that we launched um, in, uh, in, in October. So this is available already in the AWS marketplace and includes already some, you know, virtual peripherals such as UART and Ethernet. So you can also be, you can also run software that connects to the internet. It's functionally accurate. So it behaves like a real hardware. So the FPGA equivalent, there's an FPGA equivalent. It behaves in the same way. And it provides more importantly, an extraction count uh, information for your uh, uh, CPU. And for the NPU, it provides a cycle approximate count of uh, your um, uh, uh, cycle approximate model um, of the MPU. So what that means is that you can measure the, uh, you can run your software, you can run your model, and you can, without getting out of your model, without getting out of your cloud, you can identify how fast that model would run in a real device. Jenny, you popped up. So I guess you have maybe a question. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a few questions. Um, maybe we'll do one or two right now and then sure. we'll save the rest for the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, but the first question is from James and he's asking, is this purely for functional testing or is it possible to benchmark performance and power as well? Great question. So I'm gonna show um, how to do uh, performance actually estimation with uh, um, with uh, ARM virtual hardware. Um, as I said, the um, your mileage might vary, so it depends. It's still a model, so it's not real hardware. So you can get some information around extraction count, and you can use that as a proxy to estimate the performance of your CPU. But for the Ethos U55 NPU, you can actually get number of cycles, which means it's way more. Um, accurate, if you want, um, uh, information on you know how performant uh, a specific model would run into into uh, Ethos U55. So it gives a very good sense of you know if it's gone how fast that will run. And, and I have an example later. In terms of power, uh, we don't have that capability right now to to estimate the power. And frankly, it depends a lot about the implementation of the of the silicon. So it depends on the design node, uh, the power. Um, um, you know, how the power is, is managing the SOC. So it's a bit more complex. Great. Um, and then another question, then we'll move on with your rest of your presentation. Um, this is from Dominic. How is sensor data fed into the virtual platform? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, interesting that I'm not gonna talk about that uh, today, um, but um, there are, we have actually material for that. So um, there are virtual peripherals that you can use to fit data. So if you, if you think about UART, uh, if you think about Ethernet uh, an Ethernet controller, for example, you can get uh, data from, from the network, right? So let's say you connect to AWS cloud or Azure cloud and you get information from there. Um, but from a peripheral perspective, so if you think about the actual sensors, what we designed is um, uh, what we called uh, virtual, uh, Actually, I forgot the name. It's, it, I think it's virtual. Uh, uh, well, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. <laughs> but it's a simulation of the peripheral. And through Python scripting, effectively, you can feed your sensor data directly into the memory of the device. So to, to, to simplify a bit, see if you, let's say you have a, a microphone. 
um, and you want to um, record an audio and you want to reproduce that. So what we do effectively is have a very simplified version of that microphone. And with a Python script, you can load directly the wave information into the memory of the device from outside effectively so that the firmware can can find that um, there's there's more material available online on the documentation on how to do that and there are examples it's actually the micro speech is one of the examples so with audio data so um, I, I can I can point you to the uh, to, to, to the right place for documentation on that Wow well, that sort of seems like sensor data is sort of limitless for this virtual virtualization. Um, but anyways, thank you for answering those questions and um, please carry on with your presentation and we'll answer the rest at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. So um, let's let's talk about quickly about quick, uh, weight clustering. So this is an optimization technique um, um, that is designed effectively to uh, optimize the speed and the um, how, you know how fast effectively a network will run into the NPU. In particular, it is designed to reduce the memory transfers between the storage where you have your weights stored and the um, NPU. Um, if you reduce the uh, obviously the the um, the number of transfers that you have there, you you have better performance because you rely less on the memory bandwidth, which is always constrained uh, into, into an SOC. Um, it's demonstrated has limited impact on accuracy, but and it, obviously that can be measured. And um, but the basic idea um, is to replace weights that are very similar in a single layer uh, with uh, the centroid. Of, of, of that cluster of layers. So there's a GIF there that shows how it works and the ethos uh, runtime as well as the Vela component, uh, Vela component leverage this uh, optimization effectively to get better performance out of the uh, ethos U55. Now, I'm not the expert on this, but if you go at that link uh, at, at the bottom of the slides, there's a much better explanation from the engineers that actually designed this and integrated in the runtime. So I uh, highly recommend it to, uh, to look at that. So if we, if we, if we take uh, this optimization, you know, one of the use cases we might ask is, okay, um, what's the performance impact of that? You know, how fast does it improve? Uh, you know, how, um, how is the performance improving uh, if I implement the weight cluster? So let's look, let's start looking at, you know, the end-to-end -end flow um, with uh, Ethos 355. You might have seen that before, but I think it's worth um, refreshing on how it works. So you start with a network topology you define, uh, you have a data set of calls, and you do the training of your network. And that's, you know, all done in terms of flow. Then once you have your, your, your TensorFlow network, which is trained, you, you need to start to uh, do the optimization uh, for the Ethos 55 to make sure that it fits uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the micro MPU uh, Ethos 55 And we adopt different techniques. Uh, we adopt weight clustering, as we mentioned in the previous slide, uh, quantization. So we, we converted the floating to 16-bit um, to or 8-bit. And then we use um, what is called a VEL optimizer, uh, which is a, um, I would call almost like a compiler if it's not quite the right uh, definition, um, that takes uh, a TensorFlow light um, model and creates an optimized, optimized version that for, for the Ethos U55 in TensorFlow light macro. So those are the kind of the steps that, that we follow to do the optimization. And then once we got the TensorFlow light micro um, uh, byte stream effectively, we can integrate in an example, be the image and get it run. Uh, in this case, we run on virtual hardware. So you know, the first part is all done in TensorFlow, so all via Python effectively, and the uh, rest is uh, done through, uh, you know, a normal uh, ARM tool. So the compiler, the, the develop optimizer, the compiler, um, and the linker and so on and so forth. And then eventually we're gonna run it on the ARM virtual hardware. So what we care about, again, um, is understanding how fast we're clustering, um, you know, how much better performance you get by doing weight clustering. So let me start with a demo. It's going to be a live demo. So hopefully everything will work fine. Um, first of all, um, let me show you very quickly where you can find ARM virtual hardware. So as I said, it's available already on uh, the AWS marketplace. And um, it's still in beta. And it doesn't have any, any cost for the software. Obviously, you know, AWS uh, charges you for, for running on EC2 as an EC2 instance. But the software per se is, is, is free while, while in beta. And the ARM virtual hardware um, uh, AMI, effectively, uh, Amazon uh, Machine Image, has already integrated <coughs> a few bits and pieces uh, that helps you 
uh, you know, basically getting started. It has a Vela compiler integrated. It has a compiler, um, I should, you know, see a C++ compiler, a linkers, uh, as well as uh, a few models uh, available. Obviously, the Corson 300 I talked about, but also uh, new models actually have been um, added uh, very recently. So uh, just for sake of time, I already launched my instance, so it's already running and I um, SSH into it. So let me open and very quickly showing uh, my Visual Studio code. So I am um, effectively connected via SSH to the, uh, to the running instance. And this is the uh, Python script that I used to um, do the full training. So if you, you know, think about the flow that I showed earlier, this is all the effectively the Python part. Um, so it's not, uh, I'm going to share this um, uh, this this script uh, at the end of the at the end of the talk, or um, so so later, so you can you, you can try yourself. But uh, there's also a, a very great uh, <laughs> Jupyter network which is um, available that basically does the same thing uh, from Elon from uh, You can you can find that online. Again, I can I can give you the link for that, and um, it's the old explanation how you do it. Um, but basically, this. A script simply uh, does the uh, training uh, of the model, download the data set, and creates uh, the uh, the TensorFlow light uh, model. Now, let me open the. I got. Uh, let me show you here. I got Putty already launched. So um, the first thing we want to do is actually build the ML model. Now, this normally takes a bit of time. Um, so I've done that already, but I can just very rapidly show you that when it runs, uh, it checks, you know, data set, data set is already downloaded. It takes a, a bit of time to load the training data. And in a few seconds or so, uh, it will um, start the training of the model, but it won't run it yet until the end. So um, I'm going to stop it. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, take a few minutes to do the uh, all epochs, even if it's a relatively small um, relatively small model. So here we go. So this, this is the, uh, uh, the, the model, effectively in the, the architecture of the model and is, and TensorFlow is now starting training, uh, training the model. Again, we don't have all time for that. So when, uh, when I'm gonna stop this for a minute um, and I'm gonna, if it goes back, here we go. So uh, we have already the model done. Um, those are identified as final model clustered dot TFLite and final model not clustered TFLite. So effectively, the script creates two versions of the same model, same train model. One with the clustered, uh, you know, with the weight clustered, uh, weight clustering um, done uh, step, and the other one without that step done. Um, for the rest, the model is exactly the same. So we really can uh, compare Apple to Apple with this uh, with this type of model. Now, if you remember again the end-to-end -end flow, um, after the quantization, we we need to call the VL optimizer. So that's what I'm, what I'm gonna do right now. So let me take the, the right um, class at first. So. This is the script that we need to run. So I basically created a very quick script that calls the Vela compiler with the right uh, parameters and uses as a parameter the uh, TensorFlow Lite model. So if we launch this, hopefully it should work. <laughs> it should uh, do the conversion. So the Vela compiler is already giving some information that really useful to understand, okay, how many cycles would it take? Uh, would it run on the MPU, for example? And what I normally use is this total cycle. Now, the Vela compiler does uh, effectively an estimation of what the performance looks like. It's not recommended to be used as a, you know, the only way of doing it, um, but it's a, it's a good initial proxy uh, to, uh, to be used uh, to at least give, a, uh, give an understanding of, you know, are we uh, going the right direction or not? Uh, but there are some corner cases that it, it can't detect. So the other thing I'm going to do is basically convert the other model, which um, has the weight clustering in there, and uh, basically do exactly the same thing, but with a different uh, TensorFlow light models. So the first thing that you should be able to notice is that these total cycles has been reduced, right? This is, means 
um, and also the inference time as well. So if you make a comparison, we're talking about you know 300 inference per second and almost 500 inference per second. In terms of cycles, we're talking about what is that? Uh, one million, uh, about one million cycles, and 1.6 or 1.7 almost uh, uh, cycles for the um, model without the uh, weight clustering. So great. So now we have the uh, the models that's been converted in TensorFlow Lite Micro and has been optimized, or two models, and they have been optimized for Ethos U55. So now I open the other, uh, uh, yes, here we go. I clear this image. So we're gonna open another window because now that we have the TensorFlow Lite Micro um, it effectively by stream a model, we need to integrate in a, you know, what we call an inference runner. So, you know, a, a very, you know, strict uh, example that uh, just takes a model and runs it on the Ethos U55 in a simulation environment. So first of all, we need to build it. So let's start with, actually, I should have that in my, uh, here we go. So uh, here we go. So we build the inference runner and we put as a parameter, we put, actually, let me try with the non-clustered first. So non-clustered, oh, sorry, not third bella. So I'm gonna take the model that hasn't been um, clustered, so without the weight uh, clustering. So I'm gonna run it, and basically this is calling CMake, and then it's calling Make, uh, just to build the library. And uh, the TensorFlow Lite Micro Library is already built, so that's why it you know, jumps already to 90%, because uh, the majority of the code is already being built, and I'm changing just the, um, the, the model, effectively integrated uh, in there. Wait a few seconds, shouldn't take more than that to, to build. Right, so now we have a runner. So what we're gonna do, uh, now we have a binary actually. Now we have a binary that is able to run on the uh, our virtual hardware of course on 300. So again, I created already a script just to save some time. And what I call, I call the, uh, the script to uh, make the actual run. So this is uh, effectively running a simulation of the firmware on the um, on the ARM virtual hardware of course on 300. And Again, the information that we get is similar to what we get from Vela, but this is more accurate. This is a more um, real information because it actually runs the full software. Um, so the, the, the part that we care about is really the MPU total cycle. So we can see here, we how about you know um 1.5 million kind of cycles and you know it's not far off from from the Vela compiler but um, i know that this is a this is a more reliable uh, number um now the the, the majority of the part of the simulation is uh, simulating the mpu so the, the rest of the example is very is very stripped out but let's let's start to um let's look at what's the performance like of the other model the one that um has um the weight clustering implemented in there so i'm gonna do exactly the same thing but this time i select the one that has been uh, processed with the weight clustering as step so i'm gonna do exactly the same so hopefully uh, the firmware is gonna be you know very, very similar because i just replaced uh, the model in there so very, very similar process. And you can immediately see that all of this can be scripted very, very easily into, uh, into a CI, for example. It can be very easily scripted and automated. Okay, it's building. Great, so now we have the target, we have a runner, and what's the last step? It just really to run it again. Um, it, it builds on the same file, so it replaces the one that was before. So let's run our virtual hardware and let's see how fast is this uh, model with uh, uh, weights. Here we go. So now you can immediately notice that this number went down as we expected. We know that uh, weight clustering uh, improves the performance of the MPU because it reduces the number of weights effectively uh, the MPU needs to work with and needs to transfer between the memory and the MPU. So this is a very good information. It tells us that the uh, performance um, of uh, weights clustering is actually quite, quite well. I mean, it removes more than, uh, you know, half a million of cycles. And, you know, we're talking about, I think, 30, 30 plus percent reduction in, in, uh, um, in time um, or increasing performance. So it, it looks like this is a, this is a great optimization. So, um, let me get back to the uh, to the presentation here, and 
because obviously I've done this before, so I know how it works. So what we've done, um, um, we created a network topology, we did the training, and uh, we created two different um, models, one with weight clustering, the other one without weight clustering, and then the rest is exactly the same. And we um, effectively measure two different uh, results. First one with uh, you know weight clustering and disabled, and you know it takes about uh, 1.5 million uh, cycles. And when we enabled the weight clustering, we got uh, less than a million effectively. So if we make a comparison, we can tell okay this step um, is uh, gives 36 percent performance improvements if you want, or uh, it takes 30 percent less cycles in the NPU to to run. So um, the outcome is is good. This is a this is a, a good um, a good step to add. Um, I haven't actually gone through the uh, uh, loss accuracy loss that you might get with uh, with with clustering. This is expected, um, but um, I can I, I can show you the screen actually shows that that difference. So um, it, it, I, we don't have time actually for the, for that uh, specific uh, in in this talk. But um, uh, trust me, that <laughs> you have a very similar uh, accuracy on that. So. Um, now at the end of the talk, so um, in summary, we, we've seen the challenges of the IoT and ML you know, software development and how ARM which other can kind of enable the scale and the ability to do software development through the cloud. Um, we're talking about the new generation of tiny ML application, and, you know, thanks to the uh, you know, power uh, performance that you get from the Ethos U55 MPU delivering kind of two order of magnitude performance comparing to you know traditional Cortex-M4 or Cortex-M0 uh, type, type of uh, um, uh, devices. Uh, and then we, we show um, a practical example of an ML flow and how our virtual hardware can use the, you know, using the flow to optimize the model and make sure that it runs best on the, on the targeted device. Uh, okay, so I'm at the end of the talk. Uh, there's obviously more um, information available online. Please, um, I'm not going to read all of those, but you know, you can you can just take a screenshot, and I'm sure the um, Olga actually will share the slides, so you will have those linked there. Feel free to get in touch with me. Just email me, or uh, go on the website, go on the forum, and ask any question. And as a as a um, as I mentioned earlier, this is already available on AWS Marketplace, so you can just go there. Uh, launch your EC2 instance with the uh, Arbitra Hardware AMI, and and you can just play with that. So um, yeah, with that, um, I think uh, thank you very much, and you know, looking forward to hearing uh, from from you, Jenny, or from you guys from the for, for the questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much for that talk. Um, that was really insightful. Um, so I just requested a remote control, great. Um, yes, everyone, please, if you don't wanna ask your question in the Q&A, please email Stefano or check out these links in this slide right here. Um, I think Olga will be popping up with a poll. Um, so please go ahead and fill out that poll and give your feedback. Um, that's really helpful. So we can have great more tiny email talks like this. And I think I have gained control and we'll just get back into the Q&A here. Uh, I think I need to, yeah. well, Stefano, if you wouldn't mind uh, going a couple slides ahead to where it says fill out the poll. Oh, yeah, here we yes. go. Yes, <laughs> please fill out the poll. And, and while we're doing the Q&A, please go ahead and do that and I'll get back to the questions. Um, so Stefano, um, another question, that they would like to have answered is, can we use ARM virtual hardware on our own server or are we limited to AWS for now? Uh, this is a very good question. So we are um, looking how we can enable um, effectively to run either on-prem or to other clouds. Um, at the moment, this is what we have available, um, but please stay tuned because we are working on um, how to expand this. So um, feel free to send me an email. I can, you know, uh, I can make sure that, uh, you know, we, we can talk and we can discuss how um, this is going to be available. Great. And another question from Eugene is, how fast does the hardware simulator run? Can you quote it in hardware cycles or per real time second? Ah, very good question. So, um, so ARM virtual hardware is a functionally accurate model um, of, of, of an SOC. Uh, what that means that you have a trade-off between the accuracy of the uh, modeling uh, from from kind of physical perspective and the uh, the speed that you can run that simulation. So, arbitrary hardware is not something that can be used to count to the 
you know, plus one uh, cycle, especially on the CPU. Um, but it can be used, um, and we've seen uh, partners and customers using it to uh, as a as a proxy. So we normally uh, recommend to uh, to use ARM virtual hardware to basically do the uh, performance estimation and performance regression. For example, uh, if you have uh, many more instructions being executed on the CPU um, comparing to you know a previous uh, version of that of the same software, it's likely that it's going to take longer. So you can use that as a, as a proxy for for performance. Uh, for the Ethos MPU, as I said, you get way more accurate uh, performance. We don't we don't say it's cycle accurate. We talk about cycle approximate because we don't guarantee hundred percent. Um, accuracy that's you know comes out probably off PGA really if you want that information on real hardware, um, but it's a good proxy again to be used for 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 hardware performance for the CPU. Um, th there's not really cycle accurate information on that, so we normally rely on um, on destruction cam. Great. And then uh, another question from James is: Is the quantization only in int eight? Does it also support F? Um, floating point 16, BF16, binary XOR networks, or exotics like FP8? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. And unfortunately, I'm not the expert on ethos 5 on this specific. So um, I know that the quantization, I mean, obviously you can do any quantization, but then the ethos U55 has limited supported limited support for operators and support and and uh, um, quantization and the reason for that is because it's designed to be really small in silicon because it's designed for mcu like so not kind of big um, accelerators or um, um, inference uh, mpu um, so um, i'll recommend to uh, either uh, uh, message me um, or uh, email me and i'm happy to kind of point you to the documentation of the ethos, ethos u55 um, or um, you can just uh, actually Google for Ethos U55, you find the documentation on the ARM website where it actually explains exactly what kind of operations and uh, uh, data types are, are supported. So I, I apologies, I, I'm not able to answer live, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah it, you can find that information online or just write me and I can help you. Great. Um, and then you had, so, you had a slide where it compared the Cortex M55 to the Ethos U55, and an anonymous is asking, can you please give us an intuition where the greater than 250x of the Ethos U55 comes from in that one slide with the comparison? Yeah. Um, yes. So what's, what's, what's the specific question is where... They're, they're wondering how that 255, 250 times um, compared to the Cortex M is oh. kind of calculated. Oh, so that's calculated. That's actually benchmarks. So, so oh. we basically run, run uh, it depends on the models that you have, right? So some models, uh, you know, are better uh, suited for Ethos 355 um, or, or, or less. Um, so you normally have a, a, a different types of, your mileage may vary, you know, depends on the performance. But be, being an NPU, you can imagine how, you know, much faster because you have a parallel Mac happening comparing to a CPU that has to do uh, sequentially all these operations. So um, there's also some level of um, extra, you know, smart optimization that the ARM engineer is putting the Ethos U55 and the driver to make sure that the full flow is highly optimized for, 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 uh, for, for MCU like uh, type, type of device. So, so, you know, to answer to your question, those numbers were like, measured. Uh, is benchmark. Great. Um, and then Jeffrey asks, is the simulator useful for gauging the latency of switching among models? Considering a set of models in rotation, it exceeds the capabilities to be hosted simultaneously on the Ethos U55. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat that again, Jenny, please? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question either. This might be one where we maybe we'll save it um, and we'll answer over text. But the question is, is the simulator useful for gauging the latency of switching among models? Considering a set of models in rotation that exceeds the capabilities to be hosted simultaneously on the Ethos U55. Yeah, I got it. That is it more useful for gauging the latency of switching among models considering a set of models rotation that exceeds the capabilities to be assumed, isn't it? Okay. Um, oh, that's a good question. So, so if you understand the question correctly, so you basically have um, multiple models that you want to run on a single device. And since you can't run all of those in parallel, you want to kind of run maybe, you know, two more one after the other, I guess, is that the question? And um, if you can extract the performance of that, I, I, 
I'm not sure. Um, I suspect that's basically possible. Um, I, I think the, the part that needs to be taken into consideration here is if there's any impact in uh, loading and unloading the uh, the weights, uh, because if you change the model, then you know you, you change basically the weights that, that you have there. So um, I'm actually not sure, but I'm more than happy to follow up with the engineering team on that because it, it's quite um, yeah deep technical question, but yeah. Um, it's a good question, though. So, if I understood correctly, yeah, feel free again to, oh. to drop me an email, um, but I can follow up as well. So, he clarified actually through the chat. Um, basically, he wants to use the result of one model to then be input to another model. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I see. Okay. Fair enough. So, so similar. Um, so, it's basically running two models in sequence, right? Um, so, I, I think um, we need to look at the impact of uh, loading and uh, unloading weights. I, I think. It, it is possible actually to simulate that. Um, there's no nothing stopping you. Um, so you, you, you can, I bet you can try that. Yes, I think you can try that. Yeah. But I can double check with the engineering team because there might be some effect that I'm, I'm not aware of in terms of uh, loading weights and uh, loading weights and stuff like that. Great. Um, and then an anonymous asks on what hardware can you deploy the model and firmware? On what hardware you can deploy the model on the firmware? So, um, from a so if, you, I guess you're talking about real hardware in this case. So today, the um, only available or publicly available um, silicon in, in, implementing Ethos C55 and M55 is the Alif uh, silicon. Um, that's available uh, today. Um, it's not mass uh, mass produced just yet, but um, you know, if you go to an Aleph website, you get in touch uh, with Aleph. Um, they they can. I'm sure that you know you can you can get a hold of uh, uh, prototyping board and so on and so forth. Uh, for our virtual hardware in general, um, we are uh, we launched with Ethos 355 and 55 type of device, but we recently actually added. Uh, more devices, more kind of M4, um, you know, M7, the more traditional ones. In that case, uh, your choice of silicon availability of you know, chips you can design is, is like everywhere. Mm. Yeah, great. It's very broad, yeah. Um, and then I guess we'll just have, we have two more questions. One is related to pricing, um, which I'm sure you can go into detail or on a website or some, or in over text. And then the other question is from Bob, and we have just another question in here, but Bob asks, will other target versions of these example subsystems be available in the future? Hi, Bob. <laughs> nice to hear from you. Um, so, um, it's, yes. So the, 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 we, we, we are looking at... Um, uh, expanding, actually, we already added to the uh, to the MI that you find on AWS. We already added multiple targets beyond the M55 and U55, and uh, yeah, we plan to to expand in in the near future. So uh, expect um, to hear from us in 2022 with your know, more targets available. Great. Um, and then another question from Christoph is: Is the ARM virtual hardware use tie to the Vela compiler, or mm. could I use a different pipeline to generate a binary and simulate it? So that's a good question. So it, it's not, it's not a link to the, so our virtual hardware per se is not linked to the Vela compiler. Um, however, if you're using Ethos U55, um, my understanding is that it does support today, um, but we're working actually on other uh, frameworks, uh, it does support TensorFlow like Micro. Um, as a as a as a framework, so if the, it, it depends on you know, what you're refer referring to, you're referring to the Ethos U55, or and you know, in that case, the the Vela compiler is what you need to use. Or if you're you, uh, you're referring to gener generally about Unbridge Hardware, no, there's no constraint. Those are completely separate. Great. Um, it, Jeffrey is having trouble finding some pricing, so I think actually Mark might have pasted a link in the chat. Um, but if you have any other details regarding pricing and specifications for Ethos, um, Jeffrey would be interested. Yeah, so so from a hardware perspective, unfortunately, we don't have any pricing, and that's basically you know the silicon partner, depending on you know what they uh, what they what they build. Uh, so and you know how they price. We we don't have any visibility on that, and we don't have any influence really on <laughs> on what uh, silicon partners you know to fit in the in, in the chip. Um, so. For if you're talking about specific hardware, I, I don't have any information on that or uh, or timeline. Uh, yeah, I would expect you know there's already silicon available 
um, you know, from Aleph today. Uh, mm. But there's, there's, there's others uh, coming in 2022, 2023. And if they're only doing virtual development, no hardware? So, so that um, while the, uh, the, 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 the unvirtual hardware is in beta today and, mm. and is uh, free of charge uh, beyond the uh, AWS uh, EC2 uh, cost. Uh, so today is free of charge. And, and we haven't uh, made any decision on, you know, how this uh, will look in the future. But um, it, so far, you can use it just for free um, on, uh, on, on AWS. Uh, and excluding any AWS costs. Of course, yeah. So yeah. AWS, you still need to pay EC2 instance, you know, to run, to rent the hardware from, AC, from, from, from AWS. Great. And then we just have one last question and then we'll do the outro. Um, but an anonymous also asks, how much cycle is spent in configuring the Ethos U55? Um, I don't know actually the answer to the question. I, I have a measure uh, that there's there's some some cycle. Um, I don't, actually I don't have the answer to that question. So I, yeah, um, it'll need, um, there's there's obviously some some configuration happening. The driver uh, or the Ethos U55 uh, driver uh, does most of the job in that case. Um, so, uh, but I don't, I don't know actually the number of cycles. I will, I will need to check with the, with, with the team. And I guess it depends really on the, uh, the configuration type that you have. So um, I don't have that information, but I'm, again, I'm happy to, to follow up with you with, uh, with the engineering team. Great. Um, thank you so much, Stefano, for your interesting talk. And thank you everyone for the Q&A. Um, anything that we didn't get to, like I said, Stefano will help answer um, over email or however Olga would like to facilitate that. Um, but finally, we'd like to thank the TinyML Talk strategic partners again, um, and I've listed, listed those at the very beginning of the talk, um, but you can see those here. And we'd also like to thank, I think, our executive strategic partners, ARM, the Software and Hardware Foundation for TinyML, Edge Impulse, the leading Edge ML platform in my company, Qualcomm, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous, Sentient end-to-end -end deep learning solutions for TinyML and Edge AI. And we'd also like to thank our Platinum strategic partners. Deep Light, we use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Clica Tech Global IoT Solutions. Reality AI, add advanced sensing to your product with Edge AI slash TinyML. Broad and scalable edge computing portfolio with Renaissance and our gold strategic partners, PhotoHub, Maxim Integrated, Latent AI, Micro AI, NXP, Seed Studios, SenseML, ST, SinSense, and finally, our silver strategic partners. And please join us next week when I'll give a talk about advanced anomaly detection made easy using the Edge Impulse Studio. Again, I'm Jenny Plunkett. I'm a senior developer relations engineer at Edge Impulse, and I'll see you next week. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jenny, for, for helping on this. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for listening. Looking forward yeah. to uh, hear from you. Thank you so much for letting me host. And thank you, Stefano, for that great presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great day.